Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Fifth Estate here at the Wheeler Centre and the start of our third program for the year. I'm Sally Warhaft, and it is an extra special pleasure tonight to have Kerry O'Brien with us here uh, to talk about what's gone on in the last few weeks and uh, years decades and well we might even get into centuries Kerry we'll see we'll Not see quite how that old. we go uh, he obviously needs no introduction but um, uh, for the record of course he presented 7.30 report and late line, not in that order, um, and now anchors Four Corners and has just anchored his very last federal election coverage for the ABC. Please give Kerry a very warm welcome. Thank you. I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to work out the gender balance, Sally. It's yeah, well, we, we're going we're gonna to get to that, uh, <laughs> actually, but I think the women will have to leave before we get into the really important issues of the day, because we really probably don't matter that much anymore. We might leave one, one in 20. How about that? <laughs> Let's talk about the campaign first and um, if, whether or not it was the most inept, boring, strange campaign um, that, that you've witnessed, if it was, and why if it was. Well, I, I don't think Tony Abbott would regard it as inept um, because it was a great outcome for him. So, no, uh, I, I think if you take it from the perspective that it's all about winning, then it was certainly not an inept Liberal campaign. I think that, um, uh, that you'd have to say that there's a lot about certainly the last three years of Labor and more um, that have been politically inept, not wall to wall, uh, but substantially, and, um, and the biggest aspect of ineptitude for me, and let me make very clear that I'm speaking, what, what I'm saying tonight is very much my own opinion. Um, none of this, of course, reflects the perspective uh, of the ABC, whatever that meant, <laughs> and, uh, and the person who's able to measure the perspective of the ABC, good luck to you. Um, but I thought that, that um, no matter what conversations were going on behind the scenes, no matter what story internal polling was really saying inside Labor, and there's lots of talk about how um, credible the polling was that was being used to help unseat Kevin Rudd, um, I thought that was a massive uh, mistake by Labor uh, to remove Kevin Rudd when and how they did. We will never know whether he was going to win the next election. Uh, but I think I think there's every reason to believe he would have won it, that Labor would have won it in their own right, and that even if he was as bad as uh, as his enemies inside Labor have said, um, then they could have organised a um, uh, to unseat him maybe a year into the next term, and it could have been a totally different ball game for Labor, including Gillard. And, and I think that when, when, when leaders go in a messy way, uh, there's a legacy out of that, usually. Uh, did, uh, was, there a legacy, was there a legacy that Hawke had because of the way he unseated Hayden? Um, no, no, I don't think there was, but that was, that was at least in part because Hayden went in a gracious way. Uh, I, think, I think that the way Keating uh, had to move to take power from Hawke. You can argue whether he had to or not, and certainly in Keating's terms, he was either leaving the parliament or he was going to have to do it the hard way. Um, then I think you could you could argue that there was some legacy. Uh, it certainly didn't help Keating, the start of Keating's prime ministership. And so, um, but so I would argue that there was a bad political misjudgment in that first. Uh, coup against against Rudd, um, and then the the kind of Shakespearean tragedy that then played out over the next three years, um, with Rudd unable to walk away, 
Uh, and you can understand his anger, whatever you think of the guy personally, you can understand the anger uh, at the way he went. Um, equally, if he was the man behind, one way or another, those leaks that, um, that um, blew uh, Labor's campaign in uh, 2010 to pieces, uh, then you could understand the anger that would have been directed at him as well. But it was just this endless kind of series of events. And then when you look at, at Julia Gillard's leadership, you look at the nature of their government, um, I would think that by and large um, the individual ministers in their departments probably ran reasonably efficient operations. Uh, you can argue till the cows come home about the virtues of policy, but by and large the policy uh, agenda was, um, was effectively handled through the parliament. Uh, if, there was, if, if there was an incompetence, it was a political incompetence much more than a policy incompetence. Kevin Rudd's campaign in 2007 reminded me, me a little bit of Tony Abbott's this time in that it was slick, it was, it was organised, incredibly disciplined, and everything fell his way. But the last two election campaigns, particularly for Labor, but I'm also interested in the the broader sort of environment of what a federal election campaign in Australia has become now, oh, where well. it, it's just this almost unbearable um, set piece, photo opportunities, no real speeches. The, the, the idea they still call them leaders' debates is an insult to not just us, but the English language. What, what could happen now for campaign, uh, with, with not just Liberal well, Labor, but everyone, <clears throat> that, that it changes? What, what, what has caused this and how can, could it be untangled? The actual, it's been an evolution, the process, and, and, and I suppose um, the, the, the evolution of the nature of political campaigning has, has been paralleled by, by the development of communication, really. And, and from the television age to today uh, was probably, looking back, only a matter of time. You can see why Robert Menzies didn't want to introduce it. Well, I don't, I don't know that Menzies... I don't know how good Menzies was, was at looking into the future. But, um, but um, uh, I know in that brief period when I worked for Gough Whitlam, um, a big part of what I was charged with doing, because my background was more television than print, uh, was to essentially introduce Goff to the electronic age. And, uh, and he did say to me more than once, you must remember, comrade, I am a Caxton man. <laughs> and uh, there, was, there was one point where uh, we were putting the 77 campaign agenda together. And, uh, of course, uh, people were hiding behind the couch uh, as they thrust me forward to explain to him just how many television and radio interviews he was going to be doing in that campaign. And I walked with him to his car as he continued to tell me in no uncertain terms that it was too much radio and too much television. And we got into the lift and he was grinding his teeth in the lift. Uh, but he did contain himself because it was full. Uh, and then we got to the car, and it wasn't actually a, a it, it wasn't a blue. Uh, he was just kind of frustrated at having to face up to this. And as he got into the car, he said to me, you can change me, comrade, but you can only change me so much. <laughs> and, and got into the car and drove off. But of course, he did, every, he did meet every one of those obligations. But that was, that was really the first, that campaign, 77, uh, was the first real move away from the old traditional nighttime rallies and uh, in town halls all over Australia. Uh, and, and it was the first real, um, it was the first real switch on to talk back radio. And I can remember, look, I, I don't want to chew up the time just reminiscing, but I can remember on one occasion uh, in the car with Goff driving through the western suburbs of Sydney, which seemed to have uh, attracted so much attention this time. And we heard John Laws um, uh, bagging uh, Whitlam, and uh, and what he was talking was just straight crap. It was bullshit. And uh, he'd been doing an interview with Don Ship, and then he sort of, you know, went was going on about this stuff. So I said, I said, why don't we pull into that service station, and I'll ring him and put you on. 
And he thought that was a bit of a blow to his dignity, but he agreed. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I rang and said, we've just heard what you said. I've got, uh, I've got, I've got Whitlam standing by um, to talk to John if John wants to do it. And of course, Laws was so, so flattered by this that he just, you know, had a really pleasant chat with Goff as Goff explained to him all the things he'd got wrong. But that was, so that was really, that was really the first. Uh, and, and I can remember by, uh, by 83, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to suggest that the, that the bushfires of 83 were an opportunistic pick fact. That would be grossly unfair to both leaders. Uh, but nonetheless, um, journalists and their editors were hungry for visual uh, aspects of campaigns. And by 87, you know, I can remember in 87, um, on one occasion, uh, pictures of Hawke looking completely ridiculous in a green surgical gown and mask and cap, and he looked like a green condom striding through a hospital ward. Um, and, and really, from there, it was, just, it was just an easy step, sadly, to the point where proper sit-down press conferences became the daily doorstop. And then the daily doorstop became the twice daily doorstop. And, uh, and these things were very easy to shut down. And so what you're seeing today is just the kind of the latest manifestation of that evolution. And of course it's an, it's an absolute affront to what you might call a healthy process, of a democratic process, uh, just in the same way that the kind of the way party branches have evolved. And the factional system certainly on the Labor side has evolved, but it's also the factional system is now, you know, a, a living thing inside the Liberal Party as well. So those are, you know, I mean, it's a very kind of complicated picture, really. Uh, but, but it's been a work in progress. And, and I do think that, uh, that allied with that, that sense of control, what has really come out of it is, that, is this kind of obsession with control, controlling the media, yeah. controlling the, the output of your leader, even, uh, to the point... And I can remember I was in America in 80... Uh, for the 84 campaign, I was over there as a correspondent, and Walter Mondale was the Democrat. And, uh, and <clears throat> they ran this really tight, disciplined campaign, and it was as boring as batshit. Uh, and Mondale was in a straitjacket. And he was hopeless, and Reagan, Reagan was beating him to a pulp. And it was only in the last couple of the weeks of that... Last couple of weeks of that and, and obviously, Mondale was quote-unquote on message. Uh, and it just was a disaster. And you could, I, I could just imagine the conversation he must have had one night with his minders and his staff, and he said, bugger this, you know, whatever an American equivalent of bugger is. Um, I'm going to throw the strategy away and I'm going to be myself. And that's what came through to me. For the next two weeks, he became an interesting candidate. Uh, what difference that made, I have no idea. It might have made... It was too late. Uh, and when you see that and you see the today's kind of reflection of that times 10, it's sad. Julia Gillard tried to sort of circumvent a bit of this, I thought, in and very unwisely, as it turned out, politically, um, in setting the election date for September 14th back in January. But what was or, that about, Sally? Was that about trying to keep Rudd locked out? I, I don't know. Or was it about trying to just win the headlines for a day? Or was it to be optimistic about trying to take out one chunk of what we knew was, which is the media anticipation so when's of it when be, will when's it, it be. Yeah. Well. Um, and does it, does it mean that for a leader to try something new, such as, say, the Labor Party in three years, whoever's a leader standing up and saying, <clears throat> we're going to release all our policies today, all our costings today, at the beginning of the campaign, and uh, you'll have the next four weeks to pick our brains about it. I mean, w could anything like that possibly... Could anything... Well, could it happen? Yes, it could. But will it happen? Unlikely. Because, because the politics of today have become so defensive. Uh, uh, negative and defensive. And it's not just around election time. I mean, you could argue that, uh, that Tony Abbott established supremacy over Julia Gillard within a month of this last term. Uh, sorry, with certainly within a year of the last term, and the, her her switch on um, on the carbon tax was probably the weapon that kind of, in his terms, politically that that gave him that trail to follow. 
Um, but um, the fact that he has been seen now to be so successful with such a remorselessly negative campaign, and so she set the date at the beginning of the year, but, but Tony Abbott has essentially been campaigning since the day Julia Gillard signed the agreement with the Greens and the Independents. Um, and uh, I noticed Peter Harcher the other day wrote a piece where he said that uh, the Tony Abbott has now laid down the template for Labor to follow in opposition. Well, how sad that will be if it becomes the case. Mm. That, um, and where is the imagination? Where, you see, you get down to definitions of what real leadership constitutes. I, I think a leader could smash this culture in a minute, this sort of culture of, 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 of negativity and of defensiveness. Uh, you know, testing the waters endlessly, uh, reading the tea leaves, that is the opinion polls, internal and external. Uh, and, and on the subject of polls, I mean, what a travesty the, the so-called robo polls were uh, in this campaign and the way they were reported, the incredibly shallow way that they were reported, like as if there was a truth to them. And, uh, and the discrepancy between the kind of mainstream national polling by the two major pollsters uh, and those individual seat polls, uh, chalk and cheese, mm. they are discredited. In the years you've been watching um, and you know involved in Australian political culture, what, who's who's changed more between the Liberal Party and the Labor Party? Which you know, how have each of them changed uh, and in what ways? Well, I think um, if you, you go back, I think you go back to Goff. Uh, I mean, one, one very significant difference between, between Labor and, and the Conservative parties going back to the beginning, really, uh, is, that, is that Labor always had uh, its trade union, its industrial arm. And so you had a whole bunch of union officers over the decades um, which developed a form of professionalism which fed back into the broader, uh, fed back into the Labor Party, whereas the Liberals were, were a much more, in that sense, much more an amateur party as an organisation. And, that when, and, and so um, over the years, quite a number of trade union officials who'd risen through the ranks, they'd, through the grassroots, uh, become trade union organisers, uh, trade union secretaries had gone into the parliament, not to the degree they have in more recent times, but nonetheless, there was a strand of people coming into the labour ranks over the decades that had lived and breathed politics of one form or another for, and ideology uh, for a long period in their lives. Whereas on the Liberal side, you had this sense that while a number of very capable people might have come into the parliament through the, through the conservative door, um, the structure around them was not as professionally based in a way as Labor. And yet, Menzies was able to exploit the divisions within Labor for such a long time. Uh, but so Goff comes in uh, and, uh, and he breathes the fresh air of reform into the party and it coincides with that Vietnam War era, it coincides with the 60s uh, and the kind of the passions of that generation of, uh, of, of young Australians, I suppose. I mean, there was the whole student move, the campuses were in ferment, labour was in ferment, there was a lot of passion. Um, and people, people suddenly were coming into the... If you look at the people who came into the parliament uh, from 72... Um, through in that the the uh, again to go back to Goff, I was in his office waiting for him when he came back, having formally resigned in caucus as the leader of the party after the seventy seven election. And I said, "How did it go?" And he said, "Oh, comrade, you know, if only they had given me a ministry like this one." Mm. And uh, and you know, so Goff dumping on the poor old buggers that he inherited, uh, you know, many of whom were not some of them were bitter old men. Some of them, many of them, their best years were behind them. They'd had 23 years straight in opposition, which would have been soul-destroying for so many of them. So, so this great sort of array of talent came in, and, um, and they were inherited. I mean, Hayden, they formed behind Hayden as his, as his front bench, and then Hawke inherited, that, and that became the nucleus 
really the heart and soul of the success of the Hawke Keating years. Um, but, but then factionalism uh, was sort of, uh, they developed a very professional structure around the factional process. It was a very efficient way of, you know, this was, the, this was Labor learning the lessons of the dysfunctionality of the Whitlam years. But they did it too well to the point where, you know, is it three men in Victoria that pretty much decide um, who's going to pre-select for Labor in Victoria? The Liberal Party seem much better to me at, at writing the legacy, of, of talking up their past much better than the Labor Party. Well, they're particularly good at destroying Labor's legacy. And that. And Labor is, you know, after, if you look at, but, but, after but, Keating, I think that, um, that that the the opposition that coalesced, coalesced around uh, around Kim Beasley uh, was again so defensive uh, because when when Keating went uh, it was a bad election loss and there was a deficit uh, so they essentially hid from the the best you know from from the positive legacy of the Hawke Keating years. That's right, and uh, Julie Gillard in the Guardian on the weekend was uh, obviously having a, a big go at Rudd not using the legacy of her term. But well, I yeah, thought failing yeah. to remind people that she did exactly the same thing exactly. uh, when she ran in, in I mean, you had this ridiculous 20. situation where, where Gillard couldn't talk about the achievements of the Rudd years and Rudd couldn't talk about what achievements they were able to discern of the Gillard years. And that whoever is came that up with this... Is that just ego? Is it um, but with oh, both of them? Or look, is it well, a... it might have been discomfort. Uh, and, you know, you can ally that to ego. It might have been... It, it, more than likely, it was because some strategist said, Don't you can't talk about, you know, you can't talk about that because they'll say Julia Gillard did that. I don't know. And you see, again, it comes down... A good leader is going to have a confidence about themselves. They're going to have a sense of who and what they are, what it is, the story that they have to tell. Uh, and, uh, and again, you know, um, Rudd, Rudd is credited as having been a great campaigner in 2007, and so he, he slew the giant, you know. He beat the second most successful political leader in this country's history. Um, but... Uh, and, and to the outside eye, the alliance that he and Gillard formed as leader and deputy leader had all the uh, appearance of being a very successful partnership. Uh, in more ways than one, they kind of complemented each other in one sense. I mean, paperwork would pile up on the desk when Kevin was there and decisions wouldn't be made and he'd go overseas, as he did very often, and Julia would come in and tidy the office. Um, I'm not going to suggest for a second that no, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin thought this might have been the role of a woman, but, no, no. but, um, but she was a very clearly a very efficient organiser and a very efficient, and she was extremely efficient in the way well, she dealt with her the independence and, 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 and the mega deputy. portfolio, all of those things. But just very quickly to to finish the question about Labor Liberal and who, the, who's the more organised, the more professional. There came a point where the Liberals looked across the aisle at Labor and and became envious or, uh, of, of, um, of the organisational efficiency and professionalism of Labor. Amazing. And, and mm -hmm. thought, we've got to do, you know, what do we learn from this and what do we do that we're not doing now? And I think, in a sense, they became a much more professional uh, process as well. And so what you've now seen, and is it a positive? Question mark, question mark, that... Uh, that many more of people flowing into the into the uh, liberal pre-selections are coming out of political offices. So, you've got this kind of culture replicated where are the members, the new members of parliament, new generation of MPs, are they really representative representative of the broad the, the, the broader culture of Australia? Are they people who've experienced a broad, you know, have they lived a life? a broad life before they've come into the parliament, or are they just a reflection of apparatchiks without necessarily the passions, you know, without the kind of things that, that drove people into politics in the first place mm. until the relatively recent past? Albanese and Shorten have put their hands up for the Labor leadership. Do you think either of them or anyone else in Labor has the kind of political instinct, passion and intelligence... Oh, look, to be I, this I don't, um, great leader that you... That you I think you've... I, I, I think Labor 
uh, is not in a great space in this regard. I don't um, look without going to to subjective judgments about these two guys and sitting up here pontificating, my, but you know my own my own assessments of their personalities and their their capabilities. Um, I, I don't think I think you can fairly say that neither is an exciting option for Labor, and that's probably true of the other potential candidates. Uh, there are some interesting people there, but no one actually sticks out like a sore thumb in the way you might expect a leader to. And leader, great leaders or good leaders don't always emerge like that, but sometimes sometimes good leaders and great leaders are made by the circum emerge through circumstance. Um, but uh, but you, you've got to you've got to see all of this with this in mind. If you look at Labor's primary vote as it now stands from the last election, it's 33 and a half percent. That is the lowest primary vote that Labor has recorded in a hundred years. In a hundred years, almost all the way back to Federation. And in that first decade after Federation, uh, when Labor was, was functioning, it wasn't contesting every seat. So if its primary vote was lower in that first decade, that's probably why. Mm. Now, that is, that is an incredible state of affairs for the Labor Party. And that's a huge uh, penalty that they go into the next three-year round with. And whoever is going to lead the party, that's their starting point. Now... Um, one of the recent developments in elections is that is that you can see much more frequently a more volatile vote. And I can remember the first one for me was the South Australian election uh, after they were devastated, whatever, you know, I'm not going to try and reach through my cloudy brain to um, work out precisely when it was, but, but um, uh, they had lost, I think it was Bannon, when Bannon lost, and there was a swing against Labor of 9.5%. And at the very next election, after the Liberals had changed leaders, John Olson knocked off Neil Brown, Dean Brown, Dean Brown, Dean Brown, Neil Brown. Neil, Neil Brown was a Victorian Liberal. Um, uh, so um, John Olson had knocked off Dean Brown for the leadership. It was not a popular move in the minds of the voters. And there was a 9% swing back to Labor at the next election, and they very nearly returned from probably the most devastating election result they'd faced in South Australian history. Uh, and we've seen variations of that since then. Mm. We saw Can't after the devastation, hmm, mm. after the devastation of uh, of Keating in '96, Kim Beasley won the, the the popular vote in '98. He actually scored the majority vote in the '98 election. It didn't just didn't translate into enough seats for him to win, but he very nearly did. So it's a whole new world now compared to the to the traditional sort of patterns. The Liberal Party vote, though, I think went up 1.4% this election, too. It wasn't... Uh, uh, um, I mean, is that anything for, for well, Labor to, to, to go with? I mean, it, it, it was... Well, uh, put it this way. Uh, Labor lost, has lost, it would seem, 17 seats. Um, give or take a seat. They'll probably keep McEwen by the sounds of it. Uh, will Clive Palmer get back in Fairfax? He uh, will get up in Fairfax at the moment. I think he's leading by about 64 votes and there's not a lot left to count. Um, uh, I think we'll be hearing a lot of talk of conspiracies if he loses the seat. <laughs> and um, he'll, he'll be... I think we'll be, be hearing a lot of talk about that, whether he wins or loses. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but he may... Uh, there's every chance he's going to have two senators, uh, put it that way. Um, and uh, the the route that was expected in Western Sydney didn't develop. And again, you come back to these robo polls. There was one poll in uh, in the seat of McMahon in uh, in uh, Chris Bowen's seat of McMahon, where he was on a margin of eight and a half percent that predicted he was going to lose his seat. Well, Rudd as well. And uh, well, Rudd, yeah, Rudd and with those half yep, of Queensland. Those, yeah, all of that, mm. all of that. Um, so the the vote in Western Sydney wasn't as bad for Labor as was expected. The vote in Queensland, I think, what are they? Um, um, have they lost three seats? No, I don't, they haven't lost three in Queensland. But um, the vote in Queensland certainly was not as bad. Uh, the vote in South Australia held up. Uh, there is actually, despite this primary vote, you see the, the primary vote was somewhat distorted by the, by the Palmer factor. Uh, he's, only, he's ended up with 5.5% and, 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 and take your guess as to how many of that 5.5% came from would-be Labor voters. 
Um, but the bottom line is, it was only 33 per cent who, who decided on their first, that they were going to give their first vote to Labor. But, um, but there is a base there. If Labor gets it right with its leader, uh, if it really does learn something from the past, and then you've got to ask the question, what is there to learn? Uh, <clears throat> Clichés, to me, don't count anymore uh, when people are assessing a leader. Uh, Labor, Labor, it seems to me, is not going to win the next election. Classically, Tony Abbott will have to stuff up in a big way. Uh, so it, is, so it, it really will be about the Liberals losing the election in the same way this last go was about Labor losing. Um, if you want to take any glimmer, and this, isn't, this, this is not a comment on what may be the quality of Tony Abbott's prime ministership. This is a comment on the quality of three years of wall-to-wall -wall negativity which I personally don't like, speaking personally, as somebody who does feel, I, I feel I've got some investment in Australia, hopefully remaining uh, or becoming again a robust democracy. But, um, but to me, that three years of negative campaigning from opposition is not a healthy development. Uh, I would hope that whoever leads Labor this next time around um, apart from the development of good policies, tries to go on the front foot, tries to genuinely strike a positive note, not like Kevin Rudd and say, I'm going to be Mr Positive, and then did the opposite. You know, certainly by the second half of the campaign was far more engaged in the opposite uh, than not. Then, then they have a chance of building a measure of respect again. And that then puts them into a better place if, if the the view of the electorate over the next three years about the Abbott government um, is, um, is a disappointed one. There's a lot of disappointment or a sense of it um, about what Tony Abbott did yesterday um, with the appointment of his cabinet and <coughs> there being one woman in the senior decision making. Uh, I mean, I'm somebody who had had some defence of Tony Abbott in relation to the misogyny speech. I'm somebody that has tried to give him a bit of a wider berth than perhaps other people have. Give um, him a bit more room, you mean, to prove himself. Yeah, and I, I really couldn't sleep last night. I was so disappointed um, th that he can flaunt those three daughters around for four weeks, like the three fates, and as his first significant act, after also, of course, three years of women and gender, because of Julie Gillard <clears throat> being central, I, I suspect it's going to be her enduring legacy as an ongoing, I would have hoped, more intelligent conversation about this issue in Australia. And we, we see yesterday something that is I think, unforgivable and not acceptable. Well, uh, you've got to, I suppose, also take a look at the quality of uh, both, both the men and women, and, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure how thick on the ground quality is on either side of that gender fence, I, I have to say. And, uh, and time will prove it. Time will prove it with this, uh, with this ministry, just how good the ministers turn out to be. Um, but uh, you see, I can remember back to one of Howard, was it, was it the first Howard election in 96, where there seemed to be an enormous number of women elected uh, on the coalition benches. Uh, and I certainly, I can remember the, the photos being taken, I remember the stories being written. If it wasn't, um, if it wasn't, it might have been, no, it was more recent than that. It, it might have been when, um, when uh, Kelly uh, came in in Lindsay. Uh, and it, it was, a, you know, the class of, maybe it was 2004, but it was a very big year for women members coming into the parliament under the Liberal banner. Uh, and I think uh, the Liberal Party has to take a very, regardless of the rights or wrongs of who, who Abbott had available to choose, and to me it's always a vexed issue, when you've, got a, when you've got a deck of cards in front of you, in this case, you've got a certain number of people uh, to choose from to form your ministry, 
it's always a bit of a vexed issue. Do, do, you, do you start on the premise that you've got to go for the most talented people, um, but because you've built up the pool of women who are in the parliament, therefore theoretically you've got to assume and hope that there's going to be a bigger number of talented women who, who can be selected to come in. Um, I, don't, I honestly don't know enough uh, about the qualities of the men and the women going through the depth of, uh, of, of his choice of pre-selection, but, but, but I do think that the Liberal Party has got to take a really serious look. Uh, uh, if this is a genuine reflection of the talent uh, on the parliamentary benches of the Liberal Party, then they have to really seriously, and as a matter of, I would have thought, great urgency, ask, them so, ask themselves why think, that is and what do they do about it. Do you it? think it will be a problem, an ongoing problem for Tony Abbott? Um, or will people... Well, look, you see, I think the whole issue of how Abbott is going to evolve as a government, as, uh, as a Prime Minister and the people around him as effective ministers, is, is an open book, really. Joe Hockey is treasurer. Julie Bishop is fine. No, I'm not. I mean, my that that expression wasn't casting a judgment on Joe Hockey. I'm just uh, th these are question marks. How effective a treasurer will Joe Hockey be? You're How in, effective you're a foreign minister? You're in the only green seat, you know, in the southern <laughs> hemisphere here, Kerry. <laughs> Although we have a lovely mixed audience. Yeah. <laughs> Was there a sort of filter at the it's door? A little wave, wasn't there? <laughs> um, so, uh, you, uh, one thing I've become cautious of over the years <coughs> is that when, when uh, a kind of um, a judgment is made and it becomes a sort of accepted wisdom that, cer that certain things are true, um, and in this case there was that big kind of doubt factor about Abbott. Oh, you know, we, we fear Abbott as a prime, you know, what sort of a prime minister would Tony Abbott be? And, uh, and clearly, clearly, he has had uh, problems of perception. Uh, but this kind of assumption by a lot of people that Abbott, you know, the, the thing about Abbott is unelectable. Well, clearly, that was totally, totally fundamentally wrong. Um, secondly, oh, Abbott's going to be a disaster as a prime minister. I'm very cautious about about the people rushing to the a, a rushing to the judgments, but then just accepting that if enough people say something, then it becomes true. Mm. I, I think there's every possibility that Tony Abbott will surprise people with uh, uh, with the quality of his leadership. Um, uh, I just think it's going to be one of the really fascinating aspects mm. of uh, of the next three years. And it's interesting. He's a, he's a bit. We live in this era, of course, where we think we know everything about everyone with a public profile. But he's. In, he, I think he's a bit mysterious in some ways, and I think that Kevin Rudd and Julie Gillard were too. That we. There's, that I don't feel oh, like I know him. Uh, well, partly, <laughs> and yet, funnily enough, he's been much more on display than the other two. I mean, they had. Mm. That, you know, they were scrutinised up the wazoo once they became prime ministers. But, but um, I don't know where that expression came from. <laughs> but, but, um, but Tony Abbott's uh, public persona was first developed uh, um, uh, in the Republican debate. Uh, that's where he came to a kind of prominence, and then because of that profile. Uh, he got more attention than a number of other new parliamentarians when he came into the parliament. He was a minister for nine years. He was a cabinet minister for seven, you know, with all those bike rides and all the rest of it. He was quite a highly visible minister and, of course, attracted. It was, he was a sort of lightning rod to a certain kind of controversy. Um, so I think, I think you could say that, that you've had a reasonable chance to get a sense of the Abbott persona. Um, it certainly went into lockdown um, once he became leader. And, and this, again, is the issue. Why are leaders so lacking in confidence that they've got to hide themselves? I mean, that weird aberration in the last campaign where Julia Gillard suddenly declares, now you're going to see the real Julia. And, you know, didn't the implication of what she was about to say hit any of them? Much harder to hide it when you're the actual Prime Minister, though, it isn't is. it? And with yes. Gillard, it popped out from time to time. Mm. Um, with Rudd, uh, you know, every now and again, and it, it will with Tony Abbott as well. Well, it has to. Mm. 
Uh, but, but you know, I mean, does he, is he going to be getting up every day um, and the first briefings with the coterie of advisers where they... You see, I can remember, and this is another thing that's developed over the years too, um, and it was particularly marked for me uh, with John Howard that... Um, I mean, again, under Hawke and Keating, they, had, they ran a very slick, very slick um, media operation. You know, they had, I think they called them the animals. They had a media group that essentially, essentially managed the day uh, where they had intelligence streaming back into, into the Parliament House offices, telling them what was being reported around the country, what were the negatives they had to deal with, what were the positives, and then the message would go back out about, you know, what's the message in response? And then by the time John Howard came in, and you see each side, when one side is doing something effectively, the other side is working out what's working there, what can we learn from that? Well, they certainly do if they're smart. Uh, not necessarily a great development, but uh, in terms of media manipulation, but I would ring uh, John Howard's office if I thought that there was validity in doing an interview with him on, t on I said this day tonight, on 7.30. Uh, and uh, okay, on occasions the conversation would go like this. Uh, look, I'll ask him. I'll ask him, but I'm, I'm not. Sh I don't know that he'll be interested. We've already, we've already got the message going for today, and that would mean that John Howard had either been on with Laws or with Jones, mm. with Alan Jones that morning, or when it, once he'd established his regular weekly appearance with uh, with Neil Mitchell down here in Victoria, um, or. You know, they really did say these things. Look, I'll run it up the flagpole, um, but that's least, not that's not really that's not really on message for today. At least, and I would at say, at least John Howard took talk back. Yeah, he did take talk back, yeah. which seems to endlessly have stopped. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he had confidence in mm. his capacity to deal with it. Mm. Did you know that Paul Keating actually arranged a briefing for John Laws with the Governor of the Reserve Bank? I did not. <laughs> So he took talk back seriously too, <laughs> but um, but um, the the this idea is that you work out your message for the, and and I can remember another uh, press secretary Alexander Downer's press secretary Chris Kenny who now endlessly campaigns against the ABC through the pages of the Australian, boringly. Uh, um, Chris Kenny was quoted in one of those, one of the Australian media sort of gossip columns, the, the Australian's media page, uh, on one occasion boasting about how they used uh, Tony Jones and Late Line. They, they found it very effective to go on Late Line at 10.30 in the evening to start the following day's message. This was the nature of the mm. thinking and this is what it's become. Mm. And so with the advent of 24-hour news on top of that, there is this just... I think just about mindless obsession with control. And it is unhealthy, it is wrong, it's boring, it robs the political process of spontaneity, um, of, uh, of any sense of, of um, not reality, but, but genu genuineness. Uh, and so it's become this endless play boring and destructive mm. and very unenticing for anybody that m might have thought they'd like to serve in a political life um, we will go to your questions in a moment so put your hand up and um, if an usher puts a microphone in it you'll be able to ask a, a question while you're doing that I'll, I want to ask you um, talking about the messengers Kerry about Murdoch's role in all of this, I think to you know borrow Julie Gillard's phrase, it wasn't everything and it wasn't nothing. It was something. But what sort of a something do you think it was? And have you well, ever seen anything like it? I can remember, and it was the '75 campaign. I think I can remember journalists. Uh, I can't remember whether it was the whole of News Limited. I think it was the Australian journalists and the Australian went on strike in protest at the bias that they felt their paper was projecting, not through its editorial or its comment, but through its news pages. And uh, I suspect, I'm trusting my memory here to a degree, but I suspect if you were to go back and look through the pages of The Australian from that campaign and compare it uh, with what we've seen 
uh, in Murdoch papers in this campaign, it was tame by comparison. Um, that's my memory. Uh, this was an orchestrated campaign, it seemed to me, honestly, the days, the, the, the front page, and they seemed to devote page four and five of the Telegraph to just remorselessly negative stories about Labor. Do you think that people really sit down and read them, the, those pages? Well, you know, go and do a survey of, um, of the Telegraph's readers. Uh, I mean, I would, I would argue that that's an insult to the intelligence of its readership. I would say reading them would be. <laughs> I can remember when I... Uh, uh, I worked for a Sydney newspaper, now defunct, called the Sydney Sun, and uh, it was a tabloid paper. It was an afternoon paper, and there was the Mirror in Sydney. It was the Mirror and the Sun in Melbourne. You had the um, the Melbourne Herald, which was probably the best quality. Um, I mean, it was it wasn't exactly a tabloid, really. It was a broadsheet, but it was but it was more tabloid form. But it must have been the highest quality tabloid in the world in its day. Um, but the sun was okay. I mean, by today's standards, I think the sun, you know, if it was still still existed in its then form, would probably look okay. But I can remember my editor once saying to me, Kerry, you're aiming too high with the readership. And I said, where should I be aiming? And he said, think of a mental age of around 10 to 12. <laughs> and I said... Now, if we are constantly writing to a mental age of 10 to 12, will our readers ever progress? <laughs> and he said, that's not the issue, selling papers is. Mm. And I never bought the line, ever. Mm. Never bought that line. And it was true, it's been true at times about commercial television as well. Uh, and I think it's just, I think it's a very short-sighted and stupid policy myself. Mm. I mean, I'm not going to suggest that the world is uni universally interested in, you know, deeply serious matter, but, uh, uh, but nonetheless, we want better than that and we deserve better than that. A question for Kerry. Uh, thank you for a, a really marvellous um, hour. I wish it could go on. Um, do you get a sense um, that you're, 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 both of you, that your own views about the quality of uh, the reporting um, and so on is shared across all the media outlets? Well, I would think that it's a pretty depressing picture for a young journalist coming into the game. You see, when I started all those many decades ago, um, I started in 1965. And uh, I can remember, I mean, I, I had an instinctive, um, instinctively I was looking for mentors. And, uh, and although it was only a newsroom, it was a television newsroom in Brisbane, Channel 9, and there were only five journalists in the room. But there was this guy, um, uh, there was this old guy who, when I look back, was probably about 44. <laughs> um, Charlie McCarthy was his name, and he'd been through the war. And he was a knockabout kind of guy, and he'd worked on the Argus down here. He'd worked on a number of papers. And so he became my mentor. And lovely guy, and he was, he was smart. And his advice to me was to, to sample as much variety of journalism early on as I could. Jump around. He said, he said what it, whether you end up in television for the rest of your life, you owe it yourself to experience life in a newspaper. So the very next job I took was at a newspaper. Uh, and I did exactly what he suggested. I, I moved from job to job and um, um, uh, a young journalist today, what are their choices? So it's commercial television or it's the ABC. Uh, or it's a uh, an or it's uh, or it's a commercial radio newsroom, um, most of which are skeletons now. They're kind of pooled resources. Uh, or it's essentially, unless you live in Perth, it's two newspaper groups. Rupert Murdoch controls sixty seven percent of um, of capital. I think it's Capital City um, newspaper out output in Australia. So. Uh, You've got a choice between Fairfax and News Limited, and that's a you know that's not a great that's not a great choice, and uh, and uh, the the other thing that's happened in journalism, 
uh, which is probably a reflection of what's happening more broadly too, is that um, proprietors, owners, boards, managing directors, man chief executives have, uh, have uh, decided that, um, uh, that the price of experience is too much to pay, so much better to um, load your newsrooms up in the case of journalism, of the media, load your newsrooms up with as many young people as you can fill it with to run a reasonable product and, and don't value age and experience. So I would hazard a guess that the average age, uh, it's certainly true of the ABC and I'm sure it's true for probably every newsroom around the country, the average age in those newsrooms has just kept coming down and down and down because it's cheaper. Another real problem with that, that you know, you, you did a cadetship, um, they barely exist anymore, and now what's happening is all the those... The ABC still has them. They still have them. Uh, but everywhere else, you've got these young people that have all been to journalism school. It's been what was a trade and a mentoring um, system of apprenticeship has become professionalised and everyone's going to the same few schools. And there's a... I think there's a, a sameness about what's coming Quite out possibly. of that. I mean, mm. I, I've, I've thought about this a number of times, and some of the great journalists, really, mm. uh, in our history, uh, started as copy boys, mm. mostly, mm. because it was more a male thing than female, obviously, for, you know, until the last sort of 40 years, 30, 30 40 years, but some copy girls as well. But, uh, you know, someone like an Ellen Ramsey, um, for instance, just as one for instance, I suspect it might have been true of Laurie. Oh, no, no, Laurie had come out of university, but but all did cadetship certainly. But a number of them started at the age of 15. They didn't go to university, uh, and I'm not saying that that would be a blessing today. Uh, but but nonetheless, um, the same problem that we have with politics today, where there is a kind of homogeneity of uh, you know, there's a sort of sameness of the people coming in. It seems. Uh, there is a danger of that happening in journalism too. Mm. Um, Kerry, th thank you for um, sharing your thoughts with us this evening. Um, I just wonder if you could share one more in relation to that uh, fantastic community campaign in Indi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's interesting, and I look, I, I have no great expertise about Indi. Um, but it was interesting to note, if I've got this right, that Sophie uh, Mirabella's vote has been going down and down. This has not just been uh, this has not just been a phenomenon of one election. Uh, and maybe it was one of those cases where it just needed the right person to come along. And it was interesting. I mean, Tony Windsor, uh, whatever whatever people felt about the rightness or wrongness of his decision to back Labor over the Liberals when he came from essentially a, 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 a more conservative electorate. Uh, but I think he emerged from his three years uh, with a dignity and a respect and a credibility and a sense, there was a sense of wisdom and, it's, and of centeredness about him. Uh, so when he was being interviewed by Barry Cassidy uh, on Insiders at the start of the campaign and was moved to observe um, uh, there was one person he singled out for negative comment, and it was Sophie Mirabella. And there was uh, there was Rob Oakeshott saying, "Well, I I I don't I I play the ball, not the man, but I'd <laughs> but have to sort of, agree. But I'd have yeah. to I'd have to say I've got to agree with Tony." Yeah. And then Tony wins a campaign for McGovern in uh, in um, is it McGovern Mac McGowan McGowan in uh, in Indi which uh, wouldn't have helped Sophie Mirabella at all. Mm. That's interesting. Hi, thank you, thank you both. Um, three is a very dynamic number, I think. <laughs> and you haven't had much to say about the Greens tonight. And I sensed all throughout this long time leading up to the election, that there was almost a visceral distaste for the Greens amongst the media. I saw 
An example of it, even last night, I thought with Tony Jones on Q&A, usually I turn the Q&A off, I've had enough. But I was quite struck by the way that he cut off, um, I've forgotten her name, the the young woman from Queensland, and yet let a couple of blokes on either of her side ramble on quite a lot. All right, that may not be a Greens thing. Of course, that could be a chick thing. (laughs) (laughs) I think Tony Tony and his partner would be deeply offended. Uh, Kerry, Um, is there a... Sarah Sarah Ferguson... um, He's a fairly strong woman. True. Uh, uh, look, what do you think with the... And, and I, I'd like to add on to that, if you think the seat of Melbourne has become a sort of safe green seat. I think the greater issue about the Greens was the change of leadership. Um, I'm, I'm not sure uh, that that has been an effective transition. Um, I, I, you know, it's arguable as to whether Christine Milne has risen to the challenge. Um, uh, Adam Bant has always struck me as an intelligent and solid performer. Um, I'd, uh, I mean, I want to go away and think about that. I, to be, uh, to be honest, I'm not sure that I actually witnessed enough of the campaign to be able to make that judgment. I, I thought there was a kind of, uh, uh, I think that that if there was a shallowness about the Greens, it wasn't, uh, I suspect it would have been less about a prejudice than simply kind of being mesmerised by the struggle between Rudd and, uh, and, and Abbott. Uh, and really um, the, the, the kind of issue of what, of what campaigning has become, which is this sort of presidential style where it's about the personalities more than it is about anything else. I mean, I, I certainly, um, uh, I mean, I don't feel I've got a prejudice, a particular prejudice about the Greens. I would have a number of critical questions as I would about the others, but um, I can't, I can't, I don't feel competent to answer your broad, your broad question, you know, answer your question broadly. Uh, yeah, just um, if you could give your observations on a couple of um, points, I guess the first one being just Clive Palmer's um, campaign, just the amount of money he spent, the, what, what does that signify about perhaps the future of, Not good. of campaigning in Australia? And secondly, just the elevation of someone like Clive Palmer, particularly potentially having balance of power in the Senate where he has substantial business interests that could be fur- so his personal business interests could be furthered through decisions that are he takes or his party takes. Uh, and, and what does that mean for democracy? Well, uh, Rupert Murdoch was almost a candidate. Um, I don't mean that literally, but, but I mean, uh, what was the motivation behind the incredibly anti-Labor campaign at News Limited? Mm. Was that uh, simply because Rupert Murdoch and therefore his people felt that Labor was such an appalling government that uh, they had to do Australia a favour in, in, in the way they covered it? Well, Tony Abbott um, gave Rupert Murdoch three million dollars in this campaign in that uh, that announcement for the Brisbane. Broncos, that $5 million that the, the Brisbane Broncos, 70% of it's owned by Rupert Murdoch. It's to come to your specific point about Clive Palmer, um, it says a couple of things, I think. One, uh, the vote he attracted broadly was, I think, a disaffected Labor vote. Um, and, uh, and as a result of that, we've got uh, probably two, possibly even three Palmer um, um, representatives on the way to the Senate. Tasmania is still a possibility. Western Australia is a possibility. And Queensland is a given. Um, I think so. I think he was a kind of lightning rod for disaffection. Um, it certainly couldn't have been the quality of his um, <laughs> of his outpourings. Uh, but but he's this larger than life figure. Some journalists found him a figure of fun. Uh, that plus the sheer weight of money. But uh, I mean, I was, I was thinking as you were asking the question, I suddenly had this flashback to Max Gillies uh, <laughs> doing the ad for Labor in whatever campaign that was in Victoria uh, where um, he did um, John Elliott, where he said, oh, I, I uh, wanted a party, so I went out and bought one. <laughs> uh, so Clive Palmer is the party. It's a bizarre kind of manifestation 
of democracy, really, uh, backed by the sheer weight of money. So I wouldn't have thought that was a help. But again, you know, people will make their judgment next time around whether he gets into the parliament. I don't know how much thought he's actually given uh, to how much time he will have to spend sandwiched between Bob Catter and Adam Bant. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, be quite careful. a sandwich filling, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kerry, for that. We have to end it here so we can all leave with that lovely image in the top of our minds. Um, it's been wonderful to have you here and hear your reflections. I, um, I, I missed the old tally room. Did you? Oh, yes, I did. I mean, look, once we were into it, I'd forgotten about it. And, and the tally room uh, had become less and less relevant really i mean it was more a kind of backdrop but but i suppose and it was and it was canberra uh i kind of liked that gotta say oh look uh, the, the last time it you know the, the 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 people would turn up if they thought there was going to be a change of government and you know so in 2007 i you could fairly guess that the majority of people who turned up were people who were hoping for a Labor victory. And there was the kind of, we had uh, Julia Gillard on our panel and immediately behind us, there was the, you know, there was the crowd of uh, Gillard chanters, um, uh, which provided great atmosphere in one sense, but in another became annoying because you couldn't hear yourself speak at one point. Um, but that was because Channel 9 had uh, a guy, Charles Firth, who had been a chaser once, uh, they'd employed him to stir up the crowd for effect. So he was doing Mexican waves behind us, which was stupid. <laughs> and, and, and really, you know, it was, it was not what the, the tally room was about. So people were starting to use it as a prop. And yes, it's, it's the passing of something. Mm. Uh, and, and, but at the same time, um, I must say that I thought, I thought technically uh, our coverage was flawless. So, and, but I've never minded the odd gremlin in the works, you know. I've never, people understand that you're flying by the seat of your pants to a degree and it's, well, it's part of what makes television work I to me. I think in uh, many other ways it was flawless as well. I did miss the tally room. I will miss you way more <laughs> in well, 2016. <laughs> uh, thank you, Kerry O'Brien. Thank you. Thanks, Sally.